Well, hello there, beautiful teachers, and welcome to another Vibrant Music Teacher Chat. This is the weekly show on YouTube where we talk about all things music teaching, particularly from a piano teacher's perspective, because that's what I am. And if we haven't met before, hey, I'm a piano teacher. I'm in Ireland and I run a site called Vibrant Music Teaching, where I help music teachers to teach more creatively and have more fun and run effective businesses. So everything you need, really. On this show, we talk about the latest news and goings on in the music teaching industry, as well as one special topic each week. And today we're talking about recitals. So whether you do concerts or recitals or even exams, I think a lot of this advice will be relevant for, to you. Before we get there, though, we have a very important choice to make. The choice is not yellow. Hang on a second. Let's fix this. And hopefully it will work. Uh oh, no, I think I'm going to have to save those snap cameras for next week. There was an update in their app and I think they broke it. So that's very good. We'll save that for next time, but we will still do Ask Me Anything at the end. So if you have a question about anything as we go through today's show, please do ask it. It doesn't have to be on the topic of recitals. Just write the word question at the start of it and then your question. And I'll make sure to try and come back to all of those if possible at the very end. So if it's not relevant to the current flow of conversation, I won't answer it right then, but I will come back to it in our question section at the end if I've missed it. All right, but it's time to warm up. We haven't done this for a while. So we're going to warm up with Rhythm Railroad first. This is Rhythm Railroad. If you haven't met it before, here's how it works. There's symbols for things you need to do. And I, yes, I want you to actually do this at home. This is not a watch and think about how nice it would be to do that as a student. This is a do it right now. You. OK, I think you got it right. So we've got a light blue color that is tap one hand on your knee on a table. Then we've got orange that's touch your shoulders. We've got the heart. I do that as this, but some of my students do this. Either is fine. And that's all the symbols in this one. Okay. So there's going to be a backing track. Once I start that, it'll have a count in and then we'll try the actions, but we're going to practice together first just to go through them. Okay. So let's do it together. One, two, ready, go. Ta, two, three, four. Ta, ti, ti, ta, ta. Ta 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 ti ti ta ta Which where where am I? Ti ti ta ti 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 ta tu ta tu Okay <laughs> When it doesn't go well with just me speaking, we know it's gonna be a tough one with the track, but let's give it a go. up until the second last bar that's pretty good going <laughs> we're just gonna do one of those today and we're gonna hop over to sulfa railroad and give one of those a go as well so this is sulfa singing this is the first level so it only uses me so and la if you're new to sulfa singing this is a great place to get started okay so we have we're starting on me this time and then it goes so so me so la la i'm sure you're not new to music reading if you're watching this so you can handle it do give it a go and if you hate sulfur that's fine just hum along or say do 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 or make up your own words we're going to jump straight in with the track there's going to be the tonic chord and then a starting note and then the drummer counts us in and I'm going to do the cymbals because it doesn't work so well when I sing along with the track on this in the show. OK, let's try it. If 
you, like me, kind of want to get better at the hand signs, you'll notice I'm not perfect at it. It's not something I was particularly trained in or have a ton of practice with. I just use them a bit. So, But I have been using them anytime I do self rail rope with my students because I think it's a great chance for me to practice and the exercises are simple enough that I'm not, you know, I'm still going to sing accurately. <laughs> I'm not going to get messed up by my own hand signs and want to get better at doing both together. So that's something I've been working on while they work on reading the basic patterns there. Okay, I hope you're feeling warmed up and ready to go. Let's get into our news. All right, so I feel like there's a lot to catch up on because we didn't have news last week and I'm sure you've had news going on too the past four or so weeks. So if you're not aware why we were off, we were off for what's Easter break here in Ireland and Uh, The first week I was running the teacher turbo booth, so shout out to any of you who were there. It was so much fun. And then the second week I knew I would need a break because the teacher turbo boost is incredibly fun for me, but it's also a lot for me to run. It's a five day conference, so it is a lot of energy required. And so I took the week after that off and I went to France with my husband and it was really fun. We got the boat over. I love a good long boat and train journey versus getting on a plane. I know on a plane you just get there instantly, but I like to see the journey. I'm one of those weird people. So we got a ferry overnight and then a train all the way down to the bottom of France, which was really fun. And when I say all the way down, all the Americans and Canadians watching, that's not very far in your terms, but in European terms, that's pretty far. So yeah, we were in the South of France. And the reason I wanted to tell you about that was not just to share my life with you, but also the relevant part. We got there and I was looking things up to do in the area. And I discovered that just down the road, like literally the next town over from the little town where we were staying, was a salt marsh, which the sea like flooded in and now it's just all marshy. And it's a haven for birds. And guess what type of birds there were there? Flamingos! Oh my gosh. So we got to see real flamingos in the wild, having fun. They are even more beautiful. Honestly, they're such beautiful birds. And it wasn't even just me being strangely obsessed with them because of the whole VMT connection. But actually, my husband was like, wow, those are beautiful birds. Um, So yes, it was incredible. It was so, so fortuitous that they were just down the road. So we cycled down to them and we kind of cycled through the salt marsh that we had to get off a lot because it was a marsh. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, it was amazing. So that was my little break. And then I've been back a couple of weeks in the studio and a lot of stuff going on there. So we have our recital Saturday week. So just under two weeks now. And... Yeah, it's always a lot to prepare, um, for sure, but it's going to be fun. It's our first bigger in-person one. We had little mini ones uh, in December. I didn't feel we were quite at the stage of hiring a hall or anything like that. So we had little ones with just three or four families in each group uh, in December. And this is our first bigger one. It's going to be a two-parter so that they're not each one isn't too long, etc., and I'm really looking forward to it. It's a new venue, but I've double confirmed with them. So I'm hoping nothing will go wrong and they seem very reliable. And the piano is actually way better than any of the other venues that we've had in the past. Um, so for the students who will notice that, that's going to be a real treat. For the younger ones, they're just going to be focused on the fact that they're in a concert, right? It, it, you get so absorbed by that. But for the ones who have a bit more experience playing on different pianos, I think that's going to be really a treat for them. It's a Yamaha Grand, but it's it's really nice. It's got a lovely tone and the acoustics is a church space, um, kind of more of a chapel. But anyway, and uh, it's it's incredible. The sound in there is so good. I went to a little workshop thing um where she was demonstrating a lot of pieces in there and it was good so i'm really looking forward to that but we have other things going on as well so we do a composing project every year this year we did 
arranging of Irish folk music and dance music. So my students created their own version. We kind of tweaked one of the main themes from a folk tune. And then they added a B section, which they wrote entirely by themselves. And then we tweaked the A section more for when it came back. So they're all ABA form. I like to do something different with that project every year, but I always like to produce a book. So when that comes in, just in the final stages of setting up the printing for it now. So when that comes in, I will give you a little peek at that because hopefully it'll turn out really well. And the students always really love receiving those. And then in VMT land and other stuff I've been doing, well, I've had a lot of things going on. We, we had the masterclass today. So if any of you made it to the morning se session and are now here, um, it was wonderful. Uh, it was a, a reasonable sized group. The morning sessions are always a bit quieter because it's very early in the US and Canada, but it was a great little group and we had lots of really wonderful questions, which I loved. So we have the next session of that. If you're a member and you're watching this live, the next session is basically directly after this. So if you want to come along, please do. That's all about changing your policies, raising your rates, and I'm walking you through step by step and I'm there to answer your questions. So it's a very interactive session, which is why coming live is so beneficial. And then I've been doing a lot of content as usual for the site and for the blog and everything. One of the main things I've been doing for the last week is some batches of scale sync, which are our vid where we have backing tracks and then I record videos of me playing each scale with each backing track. Each set has 102 and I realized, as I did last week, that I have now gone over the thousand video mark. So I've recorded over a thousand. I counted exactly, but I've kind of forgotten right now. I think it's a thousand and sixteen. Could have got that wrong. Um, videos so far like that actually passed muster, right? There's a bunch of outtakes in there. So I've recorded probably several thousand, but <laughs> we've produced now over a thousand and there's a lot more to go. The final number is under 2000. So I'm more than halfway there. <laughs> that has been an epic project. But if you've been using them, do let me know. Um, it's almost, yeah, it makes it so much more worth it. If if I hear from people that they're using them, that their students find benefit on them, whether it's the backing tracks alone or the videos, whichever one suits you and your students best. But certainly my students have really benefited from having the videos. So I'm glad I'm doing those. And yeah, it's just been a lot of fun. And we've released a lot of different things on the blog and on YouTube lately. Um, but I'm going to leave you to discover those for yourself because I want to give you a little sneak peek at something and, and get your feedback on it. Since I have you here, let me pick your brain, especially members that are watching. One little feature I'm working on that I haven't mentioned to anyone, like literally anyone. My husband who works in VMT now, he has done some work on it, but he doesn't, I haven't even explained to him what he's been doing. So nobody knows about this. <laughs> what I'm doing though, based on member feedback. So we had our survey a couple of months ago and I've been going through the feedback in detail, making sure that we're doing everything that you all really want and need. And one of the pieces of feedback we got a lot was about finding repertoire and, you know, that I do these reviews and those are really helpful, but it's not always possible to find exactly which book would be good for a certain situation. So what I'm working on putting together is a separate library of all the books that I use in my studio. Now, it's not going to be like a bookshelf level. The point of it is that it's curated. So it's going to be just all the books that I actually use on a regular basis, which is still quite a lot of books, because um, we do like to have a lot of diversity in my studio. And then some details on those so that we can organize menus for you, just like we have with the printable library and the video library, so that you can filter down, like, I want this level, this genre, and then read my little blurb about it. Just a little bit of information to give you a taste and a link to our video about it if we have one. So if that sounds good, let me know. That's what I'm, one of the bigger projects I'm working on at the moment. I'm hoping it'll be out by the end of the summer. 
so that you can use it for your next academic year. Right, that's all my news. Any feedback, any questions about those, do let me know. And we're going to go into our main topic. When it comes to planning a recital, there's a lot to consider. And we had a question recently in the Facebook group to say, hey, to those who have put together a lot of studio recitals for large amounts of students, please tell me it gets easier. And I so resonated with that because it's true. It does feel like so much. And I can promise you it does get easier and it gets easier faster if you start making lists. So definitely take a list today or take a look at our checklist, which is a blog post that I've linked in the description of this video. But I'm going to go through sort of from the start of planning a recital and then all the way through to a few of the common questions that I see popping up and of course any questions you have as well. So I like to start everything with the venue because if I can't get the venue, a venue for a certain date, well then I can't run the recital. So unless it's one that I'm doing small and I'm doing it in my home home. I used to say my home studio, but now it's just my living room where we host them. So we have a piano there. I move it to the center of the room and we can fit like 25 people. So that's for mini ones. But if I need a space, which we often do, we have about 70 students in my studio. So it's not enormous, but it's substantial. And we do need to be able to accommodate um, large numbers of students and their parents. And I like to be able to say, hey, if you want to bring grandparents, that's cool. Like, bring whoever you want, especially for the large end of year recitals. So I start with the venue. A few brief ideas for the venue might be a church, a school hall, a community hall. Um, some music shops will have a recital space. And then you might have to get creative if none of those make sense for you. But if you have ideas, do add them into the comments. We'd love to see those because it's very different in different parts of the world. Previously, I've always used a school hall. This year, I'm using a church, which is kind of connected to a school, but separate. And basically, they have a beautiful piano, and that's my reason for using them. But yeah, any space that you can find with a good piano, at least here in Dublin, that's gold dust. They are hard to find. So I start with that, make sure we can book in the date, put a deposit on it, and then tell the parents about it. After that, I ask the parents about participation. So I ask them first for just a general idea. If we're, say, like six months out, I'll first just ask them, okay, just give me a ballpark. Like, if you, if you think you might be free and they might want to do it, let me know. So most people will say yes to that. A few will opt out straight away and that's fine. Like they know there's a family event or that kid just performance is not for them. That's just for whatever reason, they're not up for it. Recital participation is not mandatory in my studio, so it is always an option, but I do try to encourage them to take part and most do. I'll then confirm this like two months before the actual recital, make sure everyone really means it, that something hasn't popped up for them. And then we get to the closer to recital stuff. So that's just the advanced planning. And you may need to do some more advanced planning if, and this is where we branch off, if you are someone who prefers that students learn a piece specifically for your recital. I am not that person. My students are going to perform a piece that they already learned in their lessons and that they love. And we just have to repolish it, relearn it a bit if it's a, a little bit, you know, got some dust on it because <laughs> they learned it a few months ago. But we don't start something fresh for the recital. So you definitely need to start a lot earlier if that's the case for you. But for me, we're going to start making sure we have our piece selections and start our rehearsal process about six weeks before the actual recital. So that's why I'm confirming with parents, making sure about two months before. So students choose the pieces or we do. It depends on the recital. This specific one, there were a lot that we were just picking for them. 
We're picking based on what we know that student likes, where they're up to in the book, what we know is a good recital piece, and what other students are doing. So that's part of the reason why sometimes we're choosing for them. So we tend to choose or heavily influence students who are in like a level one, early level two of a method book at that beginner stage, because they won't always be discerning about what makes a good concert piece. Like they're not aware of that. They don't have the information. So we will be choosing like their bigger pieces, their rote pieces, memory pieces, and um, bigger reading pieces and kind of, you know, not doing the ones that are really reading exercises and are fine and the student may like them and that's lovely. But we tend to not do this for a recital. If the student is in their first recital, they will play with a teacher duet almost without question. So we always have them play with their teacher in their first performance, especially, especially if they're on the younger side, but for most older students as well. And then we tell the student about their choice. If for some reason they're really upset about that and they hate that piece and they've never told us before, of course we will change it. And then we start the rehearsal process. So, from this point, like five to six weeks before, in every single lesson, they have to do a full concert practice. That means they come over and sit beside me, like beside my teaching chair, the other side of the room to the piano. So, it doesn't matter where you sit, but the other side of the room to the piano, make a chair for them over there. They come over, sit there. I go explain how the recital is going to look. I do this pretty much every week. I help them picture it. Okay, so there's going to be mums and dads and grannies and granddads and maybe some aunts in the audience, but it's all friends and family of the students. And there's about this many people playing. And the person playing before you, because I set the order pretty early, I'll tell them the person playing before you is so-and-so. And so-and-so... I try to give them something identifiable about them, like they're about your age, but they have red hair. Or they're playing this piece that you played about a year ago. Do you remember that piece? Okay, you're coming directly after that piece, right? So I try to give them something that's going to help them know where they are in the program because they might not be able to follow it. Even if they can read, it's really hard to track for that long, especially if they're towards the end. So help them visualize who's before them. And I'm doing that because I prefer not to announce everyone. So the ideal scenario for me is I give my welcome speech. I, I tell the first person they're playing. And then after that, it just flows. Because I honestly think me announcing students, if I'm just saying their name. Now, if you want to say nice things about them or do some special feature, that's lovely. But I would just be saying their name. And I think that's just a waste of time <laughs> to be honest I want it to flow I don't want parents to feel like it's dragging so I tell them to walk up as soon as they see the person before them bowing and then they start walking up as the person is walking back that's how it should flow if someone forgets to go of course I'm going to stand up and call them and it's no big deal so they walk up to the piano I'm in our rehearsal version I'm clapping in the teaching room as fast as I can to be lots of people of an audience and then they walk up they have to sit with their hands in their lap, raise their hands to the keys, take a deep breath, play their piece, take their hands off the keys and float them back into their lap. I always say float. Some of them have started parroting that back to me, which I love. <laughs> so float them back into their lap, get up, take a bow and go back. I don't do a bow before, so we're not practicing that. Okay, so I'm starting that rehearsal process. They do that every lesson. For some of them multiple times in a lesson and they also if they're buddy students they do it for their buddy lesson time as well so they get a lot of practice of the rehearsal stuff because i want them to get used to getting a bit nervous walking up to the piano and just like playing it as best as they can and finishing and that's it um so we start doing that and then the week before we have group workshops so that they can play for other students. So that's more rehearsal and we talk more about the concert etiquette and all that stuff. And at the same time as that, I'm finalizing the program. So as I said, I've already basically set it up. 
I, I have it drafted as soon as I know who's playing and what they're playing. I start drafting it. I put everyone in order. And then just before I don't print it. <laughs> and then just before I print it. So in the final week in the lead up to the recital, I'm checking everything. And then like three days before I print it. So I leave it until the last minute but not quite so the last minute that if there is a printer problem, I'll have an issue. I just print it at home. I fold them in half. Simple. That's it. I don't do like commercial printers or anything. I don't think that's necessary. So yeah, I print their recitals three days before. And that's when I'll also write some notes to myself or plan what I'm going to say for the welcome speech. I'm not a huge speech person. You may think from me running this show that I would give some big grandiose speech. I absolutely do not. <laughs> I just get up and welcome them and I give them the basics. So like the bathroom is where it is and try to step out during the applause and some basics about our recitals. One of them, which is not so basic, is that we use pom-poms. I didn't get out my pom-poms. Oh, wait, they're handy. Hang on a second. So we have a big basket of pom-poms in all different colors and students are invited to take them as they come in. I have a little sign I put up um, at the entrance and it, it says like children or students, I can't remember what way I worded it, but basically kids take a pom-pom, adults don't. And <laughs> they use that during the applause. They find it a lot more fun than clapping. And it also means that when a student is bowing, they're looking out in this colourful sea of pom-poms, not just like kind of stodgy clapping that tends to get less enthusiastic, if we're honest, throughout the recital. Unless someone, some, someone plays something truly spectacular. But if it's like the average late beginner student, they're not going to get the energy from parents as, as hard as I try. <laughs> so the pom-poms really help with that because kids are going to keep having fun waving them. So it always looks enthusiastic. So that's my little thing. I started doing that quite a few years ago now and we've kept it. It's our tradition at Colourful Keys and we are called Colourful Keys, so it suits us. So I explained that in my welcome speech about the pom-poms. I get them to practice and, you know, do the whole as enthusiastic as you can. Hoops and hollers are welcome, right? This is not a classical form of recital. If that's your bag, that is fine. I have no problem with that. And don't worry, I don't go to the concert hall and like woohoo at people <laughs> or bring pom-poms. <laughs> but I think for a kid's concert, it's about them and it should be something that they really enjoy. So that's just where I land on it. After that, I have one more thing that I usually say, which is I point out that it takes a lot of guts, a lot of bravery and preparation to get up here and play for a, an audience like this. And I point out to parents, that to the adults, that they would be so nervous to get up here and play for us all or make a speech. And to not discount the fact that just because they're kids, it doesn't mean it's easy. So we want full enthusiasm in that applause. And then I say, I'll be saying something in this one about how much we value ensemble work because it's something I didn't get growing up and I do really value it and I think it's really wonderful for students and I didn't play a duet until I was 19 <laughs> so I don't want my students to be in that boat and so because we value that and because we don't want any uh, student to have to be the one to go first because no one likes going first in a recital the teachers go first and we play together so we've had a lot of fun putting together our trios because there's two other teachers here working with me. So we have two trios we've been preparing and honestly, it has been so much fun to play them. Like it's just so much more joyful, at least to me, to prepare something like that versus the solo piece. But that does bring me to the question that gets asked a lot by teachers, which is, should I play in my own in my students' recital. It's about them. I don't want to feel like I'm stealing the spotlight. So I like this as a solution 
to have us play first. And even when we're doing solo pieces, we play first. Um, because we're forgotten about by the end anyway. And it does mean I can use my little burp. I mean, parents who've been with us for a while maybe have heard it a few times, but I don't care that we always go first so that no student has to go first. And when we don't play, when I used not to play, parents would kind of say it to me like, oh, we never get to hear you play. So I, I think they do like it. I, th I don't think they feel like it's us taking the spotlight or anything like that or, you know. So that's the way we do it, but it doesn't mean you have to play, so it's entirely your decision. But I do like it as first rather than last. That would feel a bit off to me. Another option, which I think Jennifer Fox is the one who does this, who plays as people are arriving. So it's kind of like the background music as people come in and take their seats and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's a great way to do it as well, because it means you're you're not the spotlight, but, you know, you have played for everyone and shared your music as well. That brings me to an idea, though, that I'm trying. So this is my new thing for this recital. I almost always try something new. This time, what we are going to do, uh, besides go to a new venue, of course, is when students come in, because I have the two other teachers as well, they're going to do the greeting, give everyone programs, talk about the pom-poms, you know, make everyone feel welcome. And I'm going to be up at the piano and any student that wants to can warm up with me with some improv at the piano while everyone's getting seated. Now, if they're late, if they're like <laughs> right down to the wire, they're not going to have a chance to do that because we will start when the last students arrive. But it does mean that there's some intro music and students can warm up. I do not get credit for this idea. This comes from Christina Whitlock, who I believe I mentioned more than anyone else on this show, but she has great ideas. She is uh, the Beyond Measure podcast, is her, is her podcast, Beyond Measure. And Christina talked about this on a recent episode, and I just thought, yes, that's the background music I've been looking for, because I've tried before um, playing, like, bringing a speaker, playing pop music that the kids would know, like Disney songs, that kind of thing. And I do like that. I like there to be something while everyone's coming in and getting seated rather than just this like nervous tension. I also think it makes it feel more like a party or a celebration, which is the vibe that I want. So I'm going to be trying that this year. I'll let you know how it goes. If it doesn't suit us, even though it suits Christina, hey, at least we gave it a go, but I think it might fit in well in our studio. So that's what we'll be doing. So that gives you some information, some overview of my recital planning process and how I normally run them. There's not a right or wrong way to do this. So if any of those things made you feel like, oh, I would hate that, or that would make me so nervous, or oh, do I really have to X, Y, Z? You don't. You get to do it your way. So whatever makes you feel good and suits your students is absolutely fine. Um... Loads of comments coming in, which is lovely. Oh, I'm so glad. Uh, Judy and Angie about the repertoire library. Glad you like that idea. Like I said, hopefully at the end of the summer on that one. Depends how long it takes us to put together the catalogue. I have started, obviously, or I wouldn't be announcing it, but... Um, Angie has... A a uh, piano store has a separate performance room. There's one near us that has a performance room. And when our school halls weren't available, I tried them this time and they stopped doing it since COVID. So hopefully they will start again because that's a nice backup option. Uh, Janine, yeah, I didn't talk about number of students. So that's why I popped your comment up. It's a good point. I think for me 30 students is the absolute max but keep in mind in this recital the end of year one students only play one piece and some of them are playing shorter pieces um so 30 students is the maximum for me that runs just over an hour in my experience with them doing one piece each but if your students are all advanced that's going to be way too many students <laughs> um it does depend on the level and the length of the pieces and that kind of thing 
And if you have them learn something specific for the recital, it may tend to be a bigger piece as well. But we don't. Um, we're doing pieces that they have done. So uh, they tend to be from the method book, from supplement books they're using, etc, etc. But yeah, 30 students is my max. In this one, we're having 20 something in each one. So we have two sessions. I think we have like 22 and then 28, something like that. Uh, so should be good, should be a good length, I hope. They both should be under an hour anyway. Yeah, good point, Rachel. I would say three months is a really good time frame if you're doing brand new pieces at the student's level. If you're really pushing the level, I would say you need more than three months. But yeah, depends on that. Yeah, polishing is a whole other skill. That's kind of how I look at it, Janine. I think to actually polish up a piece is a whole other thing. It's something some students absolutely love and excel at and it's something others basically never do until it comes to a recital. So it's definitely a great skill to have. Oh, Angie, that's such a lovely story. Sorry for pausing while I read it, but uh, she came to the recital and then wanted to play something while people walked out. So I think that's a great low pressure way for her to get involved as well. And I'm glad you're enjoying that video for preparation. Members, that's in the video library if you're looking for it. It's just, it's a video I recorded for my own students. It's nothing fancy, but it walks them through that. Sit away from your piano, walk up to it, hands in lap, play your piece, hands back in lap, that whole rigmarole that we do. So many times I also want them to do it at home, so I sent them a video to explain the full process. Um, stupendous. Yeah, Kathleen, you use them online. I love them in person. It's like a rainbow of fun in the audience. If it's your bag, like if it suits you, I think it's a wonderful thing to do. At least we really enjoy it. Mary, I wish I had experience with a backyard recital. Number one, not many people could fit in our back gardens here in Dublin. Number two, it would rain. So that would be a problem. I did look into a park recital recently when I was getting really desperate. But then luckily I found this church because park recital with the insurance plus the council costs like to our government and the equipment, it was going to be expensive. If I really was going to go that route. Okay, wonderful. I'm going to move on to our book club and then we'll get to our Ask Me Anything section at the end. So if you have any questions, keep typing the word question at the start. It does help me find them faster. So we are reading The Talent Code. It's under my pom poms now, but that's my e reader. So it's The Talent Code by Daniel Coyle. Talent Code by Daniel Coyle. We're on chapter three, and if you haven't started, now's a great time. This has been a fascinating read to me. It's, um, you might need to move through it a bit slower, I guess, than previous books, but it's not like, I'm not like zoning out because it's so hard to follow. It's just, it's not super dense or anything. It's very readable, but it does have a lot in it. Um, and I just really enjoyed it. It's basically, so far at least, it's about the brain science, I guess, behind how practice turns into skill. So it's really fascinating to me, at least. And if you've been reading it, I hope you enjoyed it. I'm just going to see if I can find my quote that I saved. Sorry, I should have opened it first. No. No, now I'm just messing. Sorry. But basically, the idea was, so I'm going to paraphrase, was that we need to think about practicing for a skill in general. Like whether it's swinging a baseball bat or playing piano or, you know, crafting a perfect ravioli, whatever we're talking about, right? We can think about it. I thought this was a great analogy like building muscle. So most people know, at least over a certain age, know that if someone wants to build big muscles, 
they should lift heavy things and the heavy things should be almost too heavy for them to lift because that tells their muscles to build more muscle. And similarly, if we want to build a skill, we have to push ourselves. We have to be almost at that point of failure in order for our brains to say, hang on, we should build that pathway, right? So again, I'm paraphrasing, read the book, goes into a lot more detail, but I thought I would draw out that little parallel because I think it's great for us to explain certain things to students, maybe, but also for you to understand it and to think about that point of challenge because it should be that point where the student can just about lift the weight, right? And that's always a hard balance. You have to keep oscillating back and forth on the line. I'm not saying you find it and you stick with it. But we always want to be aiming for that right level of challenge where the student will not fail. They're not going to drop the weight, but they feel like they almost can't pick it up. It's not like they just pick it up with no effort because then we're not really driving forward. Sometimes we should let them pick up things that take no effort for fun. Not saying we shouldn't, but when we're building skill, I thought that was a really good analogy. So if you've been reading along, let me know what stood out to you. It'll probably be different to mine because there's so much going on in this book so far. Again, we're on chapter three. That is The Talent Code by Daniel Coyle. And it's been a really fascinating read so far. I'm really enjoying it. That's the lovely snap camera being broken again. We'll fix it. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to make sure I got to all of your questions. I definitely saw some earlier that I missed. Okay, Carrie asked, I'd love more info on how you put together the... Hello, mess. Con student composition books you give to your students that include their compositions. Want to do something similar? Okay, Carrie, I'm going to give you a brief rundown of how I do it and then an option for doing it more simply, okay? So here's how we do it. First, as we do the composing process with students, we put it into MuseScore, which is a free notation software. And we do that with students in the lesson. If the students on the younger side were doing it for them, but they still find it fascinating to watch and they learn a lot from that process. And they can like point to things like putting in dynamics, they can say, oh, I want it to be forte there and things. So. It's really good to have that for reference together. So they do some hand notation first and then we start putting it into MuseScore and they do it there. Older students put it in themselves and we just do bits and pieces sometimes to save time. So we do that in the lessons. Then once I have all of them, which is mine and the other teachers, once they're all ready, which this time oh, I did count and I've forgotten how many students it is, but it's a lot. The, the book is 90 pages long, so that gives you an idea. Anyway, so once we have all the MuseScore files, I go into them, I edit them all, tidy them up, make the styling the same, etc, etc. Not maybe to a professional level, but I do my best, right? I make it look quite tidy and consistent. I export all of those, each one, as a PDF. Okay, so now I've got a pile of PDFs that are all formatted kind of the same and nice and tidy and ready to go. Here's where we might bridge off from each other, Carrie. So I then take that and I put it into InDesign, which is an Adobe program. It is paid. I have it for many other reasons, that I'm, as I'm sure you would know, Carrie. But yeah, I put them into InDesign and I make my table of contents and the, the, the cover page. Do I have a book that I can show you a cover page? This is my theory book, but this is the page I'm talking about. So I have one of these in the front, which just says the title. Just makes it look that bit more professional. So I have one of those and then the table of contents. And then it goes into all of the students' pieces in the right order with page numbers. I have that all set up and I have that separate to the cover file because then when I send it to the printer, that's the way I want it. They want it. So I set up the cover file separately, which is basically the file would look like that. That's why it's separate. So it's the full lay of the back and front. It's maybe more info than you want to carry, but you're getting it anyway. <laughs> so that's a separate file. Then I upload it to a printer. Now, 
previously I had printed them in our local printer, which is Digital Printing Ireland. Very simple name. They do a wonderful job. However, when we started getting longer books, it was too expensive because we could no longer fit in this type of binding, which is, sorry, you can't really see. But anyway, it's just a staple and we needed them to be perfect bound, which is the kind that's kind of flat on the spine and is glued in. And when it went up to that level with them, it was too expensive for us. We couldn't afford it. So then I started uploading them to um, Ingram Spark or KDB Print, which are the services that I use to print books in general, like those books, right? Like I said, that may be more information than you wanted, um, but let me give you the alternative route. Okay, so we'll take it back to when you've got MuseScore and you've exported all your PDFs and you have those. You could take them and put them in your favorite program that combines PDFs. So you could have um no let me tell you a different route because i think this would be simpler for most people so i'm trying to make this for the masses okay so instead of exporting pdfs from musecore you can export pngs which are images you could take those images and put them into canva to combine them put your cover on the front and the back if you have a back cover or design your cover right there in canva and then export all of that as a PDF and send it to your printer of choice, wherever you like, Vistaprint, local printer, whoever suits. Hope that helps. <laughs> okay. Lee, I think you've told us to, you mix the levels of students performing in the recital. How do you decide who plays ba when based on that? Okay, so I do mix things. So it's a bit of a juggling thing. I, I put all the students in a spreadsheet and then I start changing the order of them around to get a nice mix. So what I'm aiming for is, number one, I choose who's going to go first and last carefully. So the first person is going to be someone who I think is going to be pretty confident and okay with going first. Even though the teachers go first, like they're still the first student. They still feel a bit more pressure. So I'll put them first. Then I choose what's going to go last, and that's just to finish the recital on a good note. So something that's going to be well prepared, but I often like to finish with, say, a duet or something like that. So this time we actually are finishing with duets, I think, in both our recitals. Then I do the middle. And what I'm doing is just, like, dragging the different rows around in the spreadsheet until I get a mixture of levels throughout the recital. So it ideally goes, like, beginner piece with a teacher duet and then a fancier piece, and then a middling piece, and kind of goes back and forth like that. But also so that I get siblings away from each other. Because, I don't know, maybe I'm overly sensitive to this because I had four brothers. I have four brothers, but growing up I had four brothers who are all older than me. And so, you know, I wouldn't have wanted to play directly after my older brother who was better than me at everything. Like, that wouldn't have been appealing to me. I would have felt way more nervous. So I, even if some siblings don't care, I just like to do that as a practice. I put them away from each other. It also means that, so let's say you have a brother and sister, Joe and Joanne. And if Joe plays and then he walks back to his seat, there's that moment, which is honestly the best moment for a lot of kids, I think, where Joe's mom and dad say, oh my gosh, like they whisper congratulations to Joe or whoever's there with them does. And if Joanne is playing next, they don't get a chance to do that. So I always mix up the siblings as well. After that, it's just trial and error. Like I move them around and they go, uh oh, I've put, I've now got two siblings next to each other. I'll move them again. Just switching them back and forth. It doesn't take me very long. Cleana, how do you encourage teens who no longer enjoy recitals? I always work with them to pick pieces they like and prepare well, but often they are not keen on playing in front of others. Yeah, so how do I encourage them? First of all, I let them not do it if they don't want to do it. I very much believe in them having autonomy over that and they don't want to play, that's fine. And they are quite I, I also talk to them on their level, so I, I very much say to them, listen, 
I'm not gonna make you do it. That's not, I'm not in the game of making people perform things. Some teachers, if you don't know this, do require students to perform. I would never do that. However, I do regret not playing as a teen until I was like 16 in uh, concerts. And that's, in my case, it was just due to being in a studio where there weren't performances. And then suddenly I was in one where there were. And I do regret that. I wish I had played younger. So I do say that to them, like, it it does get easier the more you do it. And stopping now is going to make it trickier in the future. Um, and if they're doing music in school, I will point out that they're going to have to play for their exams in school, even if they don't do exams outside of school. So I point those things out to them. I lay it all out. I tell them to give a week to think about it and let me know next week. Sometimes they say, yeah, actually I will do it. And sometimes they say, no, I just don't want to. And I say, fine. So maybe not the convincing argument you were looking for, Kleena, but that's kind of my view on it. Okay, let me catch up with you all. <laughs> Sorry, Gary, I didn't have your comments up, but I'm glad you said keep going because I did anyway. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Thank you all so much for joining me. If you're a member and you're joining me on the masterclass, I might see you in a few minutes. If you're not or you're not available in a few minutes, then I will see you back here next week. And it's been a blast as always. Bye for now.